Yeah, yeah definitely. Yesterday, we were able. Yesterday, we had really busy day running the control of the lab. So, be free to guys have to do the thing that you can Okay, thank you for coming. Indeed. And so thank you to uh, Marisa for the invite. It's been, uh, we came yesterday and have been having a demo and we've run a lot of samples already with a number of different groups. And this is a tool that can really be used by anyone who is, uh, sorry, I'm moving that up. Well, I don't know why you guys are saying that. There we go. This is a tool that can really be used by anyone who's working with what you can think of as a nanoparticle, be it an exosome or extracellular vesicle, viruses in solution, inorganic metal nanoparticles, liposomes and other lipid nanoparticles like nanomedicine structures, all those are good candidates for analysis on the nano analyzer. And as we go into the presentation, there's a lot of other techniques out there, sizing nanoparticles and counting nanoparticles is not a new technique. So I'll try and point out some of the specific benefits of the nano analyzer platform and why it works so well. And then what it's really adding into the capabilities you may already have on hand in the flow core, like Marisa has with the NanoSite tool, the Cytoflex, and other nanoparticle sizers. So I'm Clayton Deegan. I'm the sales and applications manager for North America. We've got some different application scientists around. Um, I live in Ohio, and I did my PhD at Ohio State, it, and it was largely concerning EVs and NTA and applications of nanoparticle tracking to counting particles and figuring out where they're going. And then since then, I've worked at a couple of different companies that make analysis tools. I worked at Malvern Instruments for four years where they make the Zeta Sizer DLS machine and the NanoSite particle tracker. And then I worked at NanoView, which is kind of an EV specific microarray company. And then for about six months now, I've been the manager here at NanoFCM where we make the flow nano analyzer. So let's get started. It's a corporate presentation. So we start with a company statement that tells you what we're all about. We're all about measuring nanoparticles, bio nanoparticles of particular interest. So viruses, bacteria, EVs, mitochondria, lipid nanoparticles. We're aiming to bring reliable and quantitative measurements to the nanoscale to support the emergence of these new classes of diagnostics and therapeutics. I think that reliable is easy to achieve. Quantitative is often uh, a difficult thing to touch in the space of counting and sizing nanoparticles, or the answer that you get can be highly dependent on the technique you have chosen to use to approach the question or the lens that you're looking at the particles through. So uh, you'd like this to be interactive. You know, if you have experiences with different tools and you want to ask a question or weigh in on some of the data we're going to look at as we go through this, please just, you know, jump right in there, raise your hand and have a question. So technology overview, where we need to start. This is the actual device. These are the sheet bottles. They're one liter bottles. And it's physically, you know, bench top instrument about that big. And what we're really doing is combining the physical and the phenotyping into a single measurement at the single particle level. So we're resolving single nanoparticles. When we're interpreting their characteristics like their size, we're, some, we're akin to AFM or TEM or nanoparticle track analysis or RPS in that we're sensing the particles as individual nanoparticles when they interact with the detectors. And then on the phenotyping side, we're showing the window on close cytometry because when we're doing that, we're able to trigger these single particles. And then we have highly sensitive fluorescence detectors that can let us treat them like their cells. And then we can practically exploit a lot of intuitive labeling methods that we'll talk about to gather more information about the particles. And you may say, I've tried this before and labeling the nanoparticles is difficult. And I often am able to size them or count them on other tools, but I can't detect any of these fluorescent characteristics. And I can assure you that the fluorescence detection here will reveal that a lot of those experiments you've tried in the past probably did work. And it really is a sensitivity issue to the fluorescence that makes it difficult to see that the particles are labeled. So what are the key characteristics that let the nano FCM achieve this for nanoparticles as opposed to cells? It's a little tricky because it's nano flow cytometry, but we're not actually doing any real flow cytometry in terms of cells. The sample consumption is less than one microliter. And what it does is it goes up on a capillary. I'll pause a little bit for a second. There's a capillary sit here. You press load and the sample goes up. And it injects the sample at, at high speed to load the system up into the flow cell through the capillary. And first for the sensitivity, 
is that in the flow cell, there's only one optics line for scattering. There's not a delay between the lasers or a timing gap for the different excitations. There's one place where the photons from the scattering and the photons from any fluorescence can be emitted, and they can only go down one optics line to the two configurable fluorescence detectors or the side scatter detector. Because it's geared around nanoparticles, we actually have the detector bodies are the same. They're all akin to APDs or PMTs, but they're truly single photon counters. They're highly sensitized to small amounts of light, which is what you need when you're going to measure nanoparticles. The second characteristic of the machine is that the, the flow itself of the particle stream is actually confined in a capillary and then injected into a flow cell. And that leads to this physical situation on the left where we point out that there's a very small sample stream streaming through the laser beam, even though the laser is, is more of a macro scale. That small sample stream at very slow flow rates, things on the nanoliters per minute scale, leads to long dwell times in the laser for these small particles. And that lets us collect these different pieces of information based on the light they scatter. So this is a normal experiment lab. The top detectors just detecting side scatter in arbitrary scattering units. We'll discuss more about how we turn those into different sizes. And then you're always detecting if you see particles or not, you're always detecting on the fluorescence detectors whether there is fluorescent peaks floating by. And when you see nice little peaks going by, that's how we know we're seeing single particles go by. If we put a bunch of stuff in there, you'll just see the whole detector will just tell you that there's lots of stuff in there, not make nice single peaks like that. So sample flow rate, flow rate's a big deal. The sensitivity of the detector is a big deal. And the fluidics design is a big deal in why this works so routinely for nanoparticles and the way the flow cytometers work for cells. So that way, we're not really going to live in the conventional flow cytometry range. We could get away with mitochondria, but they're often accomplished on a sensitive conventional mammalian cells, cells, not what we're going to use. We're going to take all those principles and apply them at the small end to lipoproteins, EVs, viruses, anything under 400 nanometers is a really good candidate to be able to count and accurately size. So what does this look like? We'll talk first about side scatter based triggering. And this is taking a look at particles through the lens of, I'm gonna look if there's particles, see if I have particles, I'll talk about their size, how many there are. And then secondary to that, I'm gonna look and see if those particles have fluorescent characteristics. So in the top data stream for the event burst, those each of those peaks makes a dot on our typical flow looking dot plot. And when the peak is aligned with a green burst, it plots as a positive in the FITSI channel. And this is very routine looking data we've been making many different plots like this already yeah. in the past day and a half that have different strategies exploited to make fluorescence and some of the particles label and some don't. And in this example, this is driven by an antibody labeling of a protein on the particles. And we see in the FITSI channel that some are positive and some are not. The nice thing here is you can not detect with the scatter detector. If you didn't, if you had things that were small or free in solution, you can use it the other way and say, I don't see that these are particles. But in fact, I'll show you that I have different fluorescent characteristics available. You can gather that data too. You don't have to trigger the scatter channel to utilize the machine. And we'll see examples of that coming up. So what type of samples do fit? If you are making any type of synthetic particle in a solution, you need nothing more than to dilute the sample into the appropriate range to gather data about it without labeling it. That's, that's it. If you're making them in a solution, you're forming particles, you just need dilution. If you are getting particles made by cells, you need to do the normal types of things you would do from conditioned media or biofluids, which starts at isolation, mainly because if you just look for particles, you always see particles, but knowing that they're the ones you want, those isolation steps are important. So label-free analysis, can you put conditioned media in and see if it has particles and label them? You can. Biofluids, there are often many, many other particles that are totally extraneous to vesicles. They need to be isolated. Conditioned media, you kind of get an option. For label free, that means not labeled. You can just, at that point, it's basically like a nanosite or DLS. You put the sample in, you collect the data. A couple minutes later, you're done. If you're staining, you can either go through a free dye removal step. Most commonly now, we're actually staining at high particle concentrations and then diluting the sample down into the measurement range, which at the same time, the antibody will fall or the, the stain will fall into a not detectable range of concentration. So we're able to actually not need to do the free dye removal. Just do the staining step and dilute the sample further. When we, if we know, if we think we know how many particles are in the solution, we want to make the 
hundred microliter volumes for the for the for measuring at ten to the eighth to ten to the ninth particles per ml. So very similar to what you would try and put on the flow or the NTA anyway in terms of particle concentration. And if you don't know, you can just make a tenfold, hundredfold, thousandfold dilution and sit there and inject them until you clearly resolve the particles on the detector as single peaks. So sample acquisition in the label free, you're going to get concentration and size without doing anything else. You walk up with a big stack of samples, you didn't label them. Concentration and size do not require any sort of labeling at all. And when you do label, you'll retrieve the concentration and size for those labeled particles alongside the total anyway. And then characterization via fluorescence is the main exploitation, whether the particles are synthetic or not. And all of these things work. And we've demonstrated, I don't think we've done any lipid staining. We've done plenty of protein staining and detection. We actually succeeded with some nucleic acid detection while we were here yesterday. So mRNA, microRNA, and DNA. I think if you could have probes that were specific to any of those, you could specifically label them. What most people do on this platform is exploit somewhat non-specific DNA, RNA, intercalating dyes, and generically say that the particles are positive or negative for these nucleic acids in general, not sequence specific. That's very well reported in the literature. That's a very common application for all of our lipid nanoparticle users, people that are forming those particles that are known to have cargos. They'll use those methods to demonstrate that their therapeutic is highly loaded with the RNA cargos. Protein labeling, you can use, have the cells do it for you by tagging them with like GFP type structures, works very easily. RFP works well. Antibodies absolutely work. We use FITC and APC conjugated antibodies all the time. You can find numerous, we're going to see examples and uh, find numerous examples in the literature. And then lipids. Since it's in solution and they're still fully hydrated, most lipid dyes will properly intercalate the particles. And then you can know, I have a particle of size X, it has lipids and it has proteins on it, and or it has nucleic acids and it has lipids, more commonly for the LNP groups. This is probably, this is a mixed slide. I don't love this slide, but they, they asked me to give it. So we start with a uh, kind of not really relevant side scatter sensitivity plot where we show things that you won't normally run to describe the sensitivity. Practically, you'll run what you see on the right here all the time. You'll run a, a, mid, a truly mixed size standard every day that is mixed to that degree in the same sample. And you'll make a four peak mix to change the side scatter intensity into nanometers. The fact that they show you you could run 24 or 6.7 nanometer gold or 24 nanometer silk is somewhat irrelevant because when you do this calibration every day, the lower limit is always going to be 40 because that's just where the sizing curve sits when you do the normal calibration every day. So you will verify that you have sensitivity down to 40 nanometers for almost any material um, that you choose. The calibration is kind of open-ended too. If you were really into metal nanoparticles, you could absolutely make a standard curve with your own metal nanoparticles that you know the size of. And the software gives you a little tool to make your own calibration curve. We provide the four peak mix. We don't have the smallest peak in it. We provide that four peak mix for you to run every day though to calibrate the detector. And then more importantly, where does this instrument really separate itself in the capabilities? It's really the fluorescent sensitivity. And on the left, we say less than 10 MESF, very fair for almost any dye you choose. And then we show an example of single PE protein in solution passing the red detector and creating triggering spikes that we can count and not size because the free protein won't trigger the side scatter detector. And then resolution on the fluorescence detector, it's almost hard to get MESF beads dim enough. These 42 MESF beads show up in the middle of the log between 100 and 1K. You can see that we can trigger with the single PE down into the tens. So you have a lot of room and high resolution on the fluorescence staining. Important for EV users because many EVs are really only going to have a couple of targets available to attempt to label. If you're doing anything synthetic that's highly loaded, you'll find that there is they're very easy to label and you get bright particles. EVs labeled with antibodies are the only area where the sensitivity is really challenging to have enough signal from the particles. This is this is a good slide. Marie, Marie's and I are gonna add to this uh, publication. So, and this is a question I've asked for a long time. What these three papers, which a lot of us have probably run into before about EVs, point out is that modern sizing techniques like nano FCM, the modern MRPS systems like from Spectrodyne, and they're not going to talk about the name of you. So nano FCM and MRPS, what they try and purport here is that they generally agree with TEM. So they try and use the TEM 
to guide the feeling of who's right about the size. And they show, okay, nano FCM and MRPS say they agree with EM. And then the NTA makes them magically look bigger. Over here, we have them offset. They measure roughly the same number of particles, but they're all the NTA data is bigger, where ours is 60. Why is that? Before I would have said, because they're more sensitive, but now we've made, the reason I've made a couple pieces of data where it seems like it may be more of a sizing effect, not a counting effect. So I think we'll have to revisit this. And I think that the application of these tools to different types of particles is where this really becomes interesting. Applying them to a biological distribution of unknown mm -hmm. lower size limit makes it look like a small sided distribution could be right. Applying them to Gaussian beads that are 110 nanometers, they should both give very similar results. So I think you know, partly samples, partly because the biological samples aren't Gaussian and don't have a single size, they should be skewed in some way. And then using beads to calibrate against, they don't match perfectly the biological particles. But long story short, the counting is generally agreeable. The sensitivity for size is better in some situations with biological particles and very similar for most types of samples. Anything bigger than 100 nanometers, you're gonna have very equivalent sensitivity too for each of the individual particles. So let's look at some other cool examples. And this is a, like people do this all the time with this system. You have antibody labeled with 50. And when you, when you look at the middle distribution, that's going to be the unlabeled. You don't have to do anything to, to, to recover this data about the particles and the size distribution shape. Oftentimes though, when you label, you'll get nice confirmations of the sizing because in this case, the 50 positives all sit in the big P. When we look at the top line, it's actually only the big P. And the 50 negatives cover both the same size distribution there. And all the positives are really the big one. That type of data for where your fluorescence sits in terms of size is highly reproducible and highly quantitative. We can, we're, we're assigning the count in each of the negative and positive bins directly based on the particles that were detected in there. This is a common one for actual real isolated plasma, isolated by all these different, you got platelet free, ultra centrifugation, exo quick, PEI, QEV, UF, et cetera. What do we see first? We've sampled a lot of particles over there. The size distributions are not really appreciably different, except in the UC where we see they get a little bigger to the right. And then they stained a number of different markers here that are, we, all, we, we all see all the time, CD9, 6381. These are broadly displayed tetraspanin markers on a lot of different cells. But when we look in plasma and we've isolated EVs, which of these markers is actually the most prevalent on nanoparticles? Many of them are not highly prevalent among all particles at all because there's many particles in plasma that are not EVs. But actually, it's kind of intuitive. The CD235A or the red blood cell marker is the most common among nanoparticles because, probably because it's the most common cell. And then it descends from there and you can see the platelets and you can see some CD144 and the phosphorylacerin, but actually 963 d are they there? There's a lot, like there's billions of particles in the bloodstream, but it's not the most numerous and they are really in plasma highly heterogeneous. Instead of looking at more normal markers, here's something easier. If we start to look at CD147 positive EVs isolated from condition media, now we don't have tons of interfering particles. So if we look back real quick, these mainly get into, okay, we hit 57% in CD 235, but in CD 9, 63, when we're still only at 15% of the particles from plasma, when we shift to a cell line, a dish-based system where all the cells are homogenous, now we're suddenly achieving 50% for a marker of interest, not even a tetraspan. These are either highly concentrated on the EVs when it's a homogenous cell population, and we can use these colon fibroblast lines against colon colorectal cell cancer. There's a lot of publications about CD147, the, the don't eat me type signal. And they're showing these two cell lines. Okay, we see it in, in blocks. We see there's a lot of 147, and we actually can identify it on all these individual EVs in those. And then they do small number of patients with the CD147 plus EVs isolated from plasma. Back down to 15.4%. You're not going to get a lot of them even doing the isolation because it's not from a homogenous cell population. But they show this nice little chart with the difference between the healthy donors and the colorectal cancer patients. And this was published a few years ago and continues today.
this is another interesting piece of work from ourselves, AstraZeneca, and a number of people from NanoView also. The concept here was to make a GFP reporter system and then tag it with the mic linker and then look at CD47, SDCBP, AP map, T SPAN 14, and then 63 and 81 for there. When we target these with GFP, do they go into EVs? And does the GP, GFP end up in EVs? And are these good molecules for seemingly trafficking to EVs? And they're going to use the nano FCM to know about what percentage of the EVs from the cell line display the marker, and then in turn, how, how much of it they display relative to each other. So simple gel, when they isolate the EVs only, the AP map, T span 14, and the 63s and 81s actually guide the GFP into the EVs. The other four, control 47, AP map, and SDBC, P, SDCBP don't actually guide the GFP in to the EVs to a high degree. And then from the nano FCM data for the normalized MFI, these particles, we find that they actually incorporate it to a similar level per particle compared to the controls. And then this is a good application of cell trace deep red. So we're going to look at EVs, we're going to have our particles, and then we're going to stain them for cell trace deep red to call them EVs so that they have proteins on their surface. <laughs> And then we'll look among those red particles, how many are green, how many of those are GFP? So we find that in those control and those seemingly 47 SDCBP AP map that did not seem to guide the GFP in, we do have EVs. They just don't contain those proteins. We made lots of EVs anyway, as shown by the cell trace red. And then when we analyze those same EVs in the same run, we look at their GFP signal, very minimal GFP signal compared to bright GFP signal. So. Modifying these proteins didn't change the EV output, change which ones carry the GFP to the EVs. And then they talk about the percent of the EVs that are positive for GFP. And they find, you know, those four make very similar 30s, 30s percent of the total EVs as determined by cell trace red and scattering positivity look like they contain GFP. And the mean fluorescence intensity of that GFP is brightest in the CD63 molecule. So they didn't really find very much novel here since we could have already guessed that CD63 would be a good candidate for carrying things into EVs. Oncolytic adenovirus, this is another good example of a somewhat synthetic biology system. So here, bioengineered cell membrane nanovesicles, which is a more elaborate way of saying we're going to take cell membranes and digest them into nanovesicles. And then they encapsulate them kind of physically over these oncolytic adenoviruses. And they're going to stain with CFSE for the BCMN, so membrane interactive. And then Cyto62 is a nucleic acid stain to stain the nucleic acids inside the oncolytic adenovirus. And then when they analyze these particles and they look at which of my I have particles, which are C CFSE positives, these ones over here. And among those, how many are positive for nucleic acid? So the particle has CFSE and has nucleic acid in it. Over 60% of the particles in this type of formed system show up as positive for these dual marker reporters. This is some, we've, we've actually looked at this aspect. So we've been talking a lot about triggering based on particles being present. Do I have particles? Here we're going to look at how you can utilize things that don't scatter light to, to, to learn more about different populations that show up in some of these complex samples. So here's a viral, a T7 viral prep. And we have three separated populations on the left. The T7 variant, in the top line, we're looking at scattering. So it scatters light. And then on the bottom line, we're looking at fluorescence detection nucleic acids. So the fully the full variant scatters light and is fluorescent. The empty capsid scatters light in the blue trace on top is not fluorescent. And the T7 DNA, you can actually put three DNA to the system and stain it. Very minimal scattering and strong fluorescence detection. So when you have this complex prep now and you stain it with the nucleic acid stain and you recover these three populations, from your single controls, you can now determine what percent of this is actually formed virus. The red population is actually the variant that strongly scatters and has high fluorescence. The green, which is not scattering, is free DNA. And then you have empty capsids in the blue. And the importance of this is that when you have these complex mixtures and you're seeing that certain percents of my total are making up this family of particles, usually only a particular family of particles will track with other things like the activity, or in this case, the plaque forming units, they really only align if you count the red population only. If you try and just count the particles, you get a bunch of nonsense in the relationship with the plaque forming units because not all the particles are infectious. And when you track them against the 
red population for mature variants, you get a nice linear fit with your plaque forming units by counting the number of events you get for the full variants. And then take that a step further, AAV gene therapy type application. So AVs are really small, they're like 25 nanometers. They don't scatter enough light ever to trigger the scatter detector. So here what we've done is put together one fluorescent stain for the capsid proteins and one for the nucleic acids inside. And when we come over here and look at the dual triggering of the capsid and the nucleic acid, there's only a small percent that actually coincide. And there's many capsids that do not have uh, the nucleic acid information in them. And there's many Three nucleic acids in the in the dilution also. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> this is another type of liposome. We're supposed to see some liposomes this afternoon. And this gets into the chart at the right. We'll touch on pretty straightforward on the left. Loading demonstrated by detection of the side scatter. We know we've got particles. And then the red bursts are actually intrinsic fluorescence from doxorubicin drug loaded inside of these particles. So you can see you have total liposomes, you have 70% loading in this synthetic particle formation where 70% of the particles you can detect have a size and are loaded with the drug. What's interesting is in the blue, if we look up at the top curve, we see that silica nanoparticle, the SNIP's calibration curve, that's the same type of calibration curve that you'll make all the time for use with your particles. So you put those in, you'll have a calibration curve, and then you'll insert your particles, and they will then be fit to that curve based on the light scattering. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. The reporting for the equivalent size of a silica sphere is perfectly accurate for what it is. But sometimes we could ask, is that physically representative? And I think there's some reason I are gonna investigate more. What we can see here is in the red trace, these are the liposomes from the left. And this group has formed them at different sizes and then made a different calibration curve out of their hollow particles that are getting bigger. And what do we notice? The light scattering response of that curve, while it is still have a shape, is not equivalent to the change that goes on in our solid silica nanoparticles when they grow as kind of a cubic for mass. And we have these hollow liposomes growing. The change in scattering signal is nearly equivalent to the silica curve. So what would happen if you put the biggest peak in for your liposomes, and you knew they were 110, what size would it think they are? It would come up here and it would match the scatter to this curve, and it would report that they're 85. So the report that they're equivalent to the 85 nanometer silica is perfectly accurate based on what was measured. Is it the most physically representative method of reporting the size? That's why we leave open-ended the calibration aspects. We provide you the silica to make that curve all the time. If you have the sophisticated methods of forming different particles that are really relevant to what you do at different sizes you're confident in, you can absolutely make your own curve for interpreting the size too. And then they correlate the number of molecules of docs versus the fluorescence burst area by doing different loadings. But that top line, I think that, that, that whether you're fitting to a calibration curve or doing a first principles detection like NTA, where you're detecting the diffusion coefficient of each particle, I think that leads to a lot of the difference that's discussed in the literature for why why is the size different? Why is it say 75 versus 100? Because the subtleties of that 25 nanometers can definitely be related to the method that's been used to size the particles. I think this is my last example. It's probably the best one. If anyone's ever done F-pops with lipids, it's like a really complex fluorimeter experiment and you make them pop and you see this fluorescent change. And so we, we worked with a group, and it's amazing you can do this at the single particle level. The concept is you interpolate the lipid with an orange fluorescent dye, and then under reactive oxygen species, it'll become green fluorescent. And then the interior of the particle is red, and when it releases the drug under the reactive oxygen species, it will become less red because the drug has left the particles. And this, for these type of liposomes and, and the drug loaded in this MXT drug, this actually works as easily as running the two samples in the presence of the reactive oxygen species and not, and you see in the side scatter under the size in our ID precis, we see the shift in the side scatter intensity burst, and then the green fluorescence goes up as they open up, and the red fluorescence goes down in these particles as they release the drug. So it's like a single particle interpretation of them opening and releasing their little cargos under the influence of different other things that you can add to the solution easily. So like this example, most of the examples I, that I showed are published in the literature, and you can 
easily find in Scholar these days many, many articles using NanoFCM for EVs, viruses, liposomes, and other synthetic particles. And with that, we're at the summary. The summary is we've seen in action for the past two days is it's a simple, easy tool. We've already probably taken 50 measurements in the past two days of different samples of different concentrations. Without labeling, you'll always be able to sense your concentration and size distribution. And then when you add in the characterization of subpopulations of that total, you will also be able to easily capture the concentration, size distribution, and relative percentage of those particles in your sample and improve running time speed. It should really, when it's running well right now, we're really at three, four minutes of sample. You put the sample in, you collect the data, you put the cleaning solution in, you run the cleaning solution, you put the next sample in. And we've been up there cranking away for a couple of days and we've got a lot of nice different examples already made. So with that, open open to questions, discussion. He's ready. Yeah. This one. So you you could if but a lot of times these ones will all be under the scatter gate and there's no data for them. So if they were bigger and they did have more scattered or it was like lentivirus, we definitely see that where there's certainly fluorescence and capsid data that's not in the scattered particles. Here with the AVs, they're too small. So actually the takeaway here is they mostly assume, right? Yes. They look at that population and assume it didn't scatter. So I know it's not an aggregate. So you, you can do gating. You can do gating. In this case, it's just there's no data to gate on. That one? Not until you get really big pieces. So um, there's an example where they even have 6,000 kilobase pieces and they do not trigger the scatter while strongly triggering the fluorescence channel. So it's actually just what it's basically just what we see here. You're all anytime you turn the machine on and gather data, you're sensing scatter and you're going to gather data in the two fluorescent channels. If it's negative, that's just going to be the result you gather. Two, two fluorescence, one for scattering. And they're going to be FITSI, APC, like. We do have PE. So you can do FITSI, PE in there. Yeah. On the, you, so you take, you can't do PE, APC. You can do FITSI and PE. If you have PE, because the filter only comes out of one detector, and the same one that takes the APC filter, you have to put PE in there. Because you, just because you can't switch it out of the other. There's not a physical reason, except that the other one's glued in. The detector itself is the same. The detector bodies are the same. We just, the one with that has the switchable filter, that has to be P or APC. No more questions. Does anybody, does anybody have samples that they're suddenly dying to see run that did not already schedule time? That's probably the biggest question I have for you all. That's good, because I've been seeing a lot of people, I've seen a number of your faces up there running samples, so. That's completely fine. That's a completely reasonable answer. A good answer for someone like me who's leaving later. <laughs> yeah, until about five today. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Is there any, uh, I guess I could double check if there's not any questions online here. There's a few. Going to try to precipitate uh, the PBS. Oh, sure, because it takes that doesn't take that short amount. Of time. Yeah, it should be fine because only one sample. Yeah, if you prepare it, just bring it back. So it's something the virus that is too small because the the virus that we're studying there about thirty nanometers. I think on a slide you said it was between 20, 25. Yeah. I can only do like, like under fifty. It's like under, really, uh, under light, fifty. It's like scattering. Yeah, the light scattering one. Could you happy diet somehow to yeah. If you want to eat, yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. 
And you, you can either stain it somehow. Viruses are harder because if you try and GFP fusion them, like they don't form correctly mm -hmm. and stuff, right? Um, so staining them after the fact is generally the main strategy that people use. Okay. Um, and you said like the cutoff point would be like 50, if it's below 50 nanometers, then it's, it's the scatter is going to be a scatter. It's yeah. going to be a struggle in the scatter. And okay. if it's over 50 nanometers, okay. it really will work and it's easy. Okay. okay. And if it's under for viruses, it just, you don't see much. So then it becomes inference. That yeah. the dual signal, you assume since I didn't see it in the scatter, I'll go ahead and assume it's at most a doublet, maybe. Like it's probably a singlet of my particles at 30. Mm -hmm. And then if you start to trigger the scatter thing, then you know that those ones aren't singlets, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, I triggered the scatter. It can't be a 50 nanometer part. Okay. So it depends on your interest in doing that, but you do have to have dyes. Okay. Is it cool if I get you a card or something? Yeah. Antibody dye? Yeah, antibody, right. Like the capsid stains are generally antibodies. Yeah. Let me see. I think I did. Blue? There was one, yeah. Like I did, I did do that with someone at Colorado a couple weeks ago where they had, but they had tagged. So that when they formed, they like had some sort of tag built in them. No. no, I do not have one, but Marina definitely have yeah. mine. Yeah, they can just walk up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, try to move. <laughs> we got it. Okay. So people like that, and then they get a half hour of talking, and then. <laughs> 